We can open back up to Romans 3 today. I had a mask. I had a humdinger for Sunday school lesson that we were going to be in Romans again. But yeah, I'm going to tell y'all, y'all are sinners again. Because <laughs> that's the first part of our lesson today, Romans 3, verse 23 and 24, Lord willing, we'll look at today. If you recall from last week, we talked about how we all are guilty before God. We get we have righteousness through Christ, and it is for all who believe. He says, "For well, there is no difference." Amen. And building upon that thought, there is no difference. Paul writes in verse twenty-three: "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus." This is why there is no difference for any who believe, because all were under sin. Amen. And he says, for all have sinned. This doesn't leave out anyone or any group, whether Jew or Gentile, whether American or Asian, whether white or black, male or female. All have sinned, he says. You all, we all sinned in Adam, and we all individually have sinned as well. Amen. And this ties right into what we seen in the previous verses about how the man was guilty before God, how that all sin to all that it says verse ten that there is none righteous, no not one, there's none that seeketh after God, and there's none that understand it. So is the natural state of man. The man is a sinner. Amen. Turn back to Ecclesiastes for just a moment. We'll see this is not just something that Paul taught. Ecclesiastes chapter seven Paul bases his argument out of a lot of the books and a lot of different verses in Psalms as well as Isaiah. But in Ecclesiastes 7 here, you know Solomon talks a whole lot about the vanities of this life. Mm -hmm. In verse 20 of chapter 7, it's recorded, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good, and mm -hmm. sinneth not. And of ourselves, man is not just, man does not do good, man is a sinner. Mm -hmm. we, I think it's in 1 John, it says, if we say we have no sin, we lie. You're right. And we see of ourselves because this flesh was born into sin, and until it's changed one day, it will always be sinful. Amen. So, no, there is not. Even the best of people upon this earth, the best of people throughout history, aside from Christ Himself, all have sinned, all continue to sin. And of ourselves, there are none that are just and none that do with good. As we'll see, all of that, our justification, our goodness, our righteousness, all that comes through Christ. But what does it mean that we have sinned? I think that's one of the most people won't. Think about today. And I think of being a good person, you're okay. Hmm. But that's not what being a sinner is, being good or bad. Right. And certainly that is in maybe a part of it that you know, being bad is part of being sinful, but yet sin ultimately is a violation of God's law. Right. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. And we've all violated the law of God. Mm -hmm. I'd say we would all have violated it in thought as well as in our deeds and our actions. So that is, sin is to do that which is against God's standard. And yet, every last one of us has broken that. Amen. Even the tiniest of commandments makes us a sinner inside of God if we break that. And we think of sinners such as those who are just outright full of wickedness and people such as Hitler or even as Paul was before he was saved, the persecutor of God's people, and even killing them and throwing them in the jail. And right. 
Or how the, the idol worshippers that worship all the other idols and people who commit what we would call gross sins. Yet every last one of us have sinned before God. Amen. And that is why there is no difference, he says in verse 22. That's why we all are in need of the righteousness of Christ. We all are in need of the justification that comes through him. And to put it simply, we are all in need of a Savior. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you're not saved here today, then you still stand in that same need. Nothing in of yourselves that you can do will ever erase that sin. Therefore, you will always be guilty before God. Amen. You know, the literal definition of sin is to error or to miss the mark, and we've certainly all fallen short of God's standard. Uh, we've all come very, very short of His standard of righteousness. Amen. Man often looks at himself and thinks that he's a good person or that he's, you know, he thinks within himself that he is righteous, even if he doesn't admit that. But yet, when we compare ourselves to the Word of God, we will see that we all fall very short, even us that are saved. Yeah. We ought to be thankful for God's long suffering and His faithfulness towards us. Amen. To the flesh, sin is a lot like a drug, isn't it? Once the flesh gets a little taste of it, it just wants more and more. Right. That's why a man cannot just sin a little bit. Man sins continually over and over again. Mm -hmm. We're left to ourselves, we would dive headlong into sin. And we would be very content there. Yet for the grace of God, He restrains us. By His grace and through the leading of the Spirit, He withholds us from certain sins. Amen. We ought to be very thankful people for the grace of God. Otherwise, we would still be lost in our sins. We'd still be given completely over to the lusts and desires of the flesh. As Amen. Jesus tells us. And you can be sure we would be very content there. Yet when God deals with you, you'll begin to see your sinfulness. You'll begin to see that you are a sinner in the sight of God, that you are guilty before Him. Anyone who has truly been born again, sin should bother them. Right. I always like what Brother Pink said, it's not the absence of sin, but the sorrowing over it that Distinguishes true believers from empty professors. Amen. So we won't have the absence of sin in this life, but yet sin should bother us if we've truly been saved. If it doesn't Amen. bother you, then I would question if you've ever really experienced His grace. Amen. The last part of that verse, he says, after he says it all of sin, he says, and come short of the glory of God. That means we're, we're lacking in it, we're inferior, or we're deficient of it. But man has sought the glory of God, has sought the, the praise and acceptance of God for his own good works, and yet he's fallen far short of it. Right. Man cannot attain on that level of self justification. We turn over to John chapter 5, and we see that man does not. Seek the right kind of glory or honor as it's translated here. John chapter 5, verse 43. Verse 43 and verse 44, excuse me, and it says, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, he will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? You bet. That honor is the same as the glory in our text back here in Romans 3. It's also translated praise in other places. But man seeks 
oftentimes the glory and praise and honor of men rather than of God. Right. right. In another place, he told them that the chief, there was chief rulers that were afraid of being put out of the synagogue because they sought the praise of men rather than the praise of God. That's the things in John chapter 12. So we ought to seek the glory which comes from God. But it can only come to us through the person of Christ. It cannot come through our own self-justification. Amen. We can never be approved or acceptable in the sight of God in and of ourselves. I think it's Ephesians 1 tells us that he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. In Christ. Man by nature seeks the approval of fellow men and perhaps in a sense he wants the approval of God but he doesn't want it through the right means. Mm -hmm. Romans 8 verse 18 tells us that there is coming a day which we shall receive the glory of God. For I reckon that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. But we only have that glory because of Christ. We're not going to receive that glory because of what we have done, but rather what He has done for us. I don't fully really understand what all that glory is going to entail. I know we'll have a, a glorious body like in His glorious body. I know we'll be free from sin in every aspect and every form. You've had. I know we'll be able to praise Him around the throne forever and ever. But that is what the glory that awaits the child of God. That's right. Because it's not, we don't receive that because of something we have done or something we will do or because we hold out faithful or any of these other things because we prayed through or because we gave enough money to the church or because we were baptized. Simply because of what Christ and what he has done for us. Amen. And there's an, another way which we fall short of the glory of God, and that's in giving him the glory that he is due. And Revelation 4, 11 tells us that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For his pleasure we are and were created. Amen. We were created to give glory unto God. That was ultimately the purpose of him creating man was to bring glory to himself. Amen. And yet because of sin we fall far short of that. And I would say even us that are saved we fall short of that as well. Mm -hmm. But especially before we are saved we don't give him the glory that is due his name. We don't glorify him like we ought to. If anything we bring him dishonor mm -hmm. rather than bring him honor. And in that sense we come short of the glory of God also. Amen. We're going to verse 24. <laughs> We see the answer here to, to the problem that is in verse 23. We are sinners. We fall short of the mark. We are cannot attain to the level of righteousness which God requires. But verse 24 gives us the answer here. He says, being justified freely by his grace the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. We begin by saying being justified freely. We know that to be justified means to be declared innocent and in God's justification. Not only are we declared innocent, but we're also pronounced righteous in His sight. We, we've seen that this cannot come by the keeping of the law. First 20 back in Romans 3 here, it says, Therefore, the need of the law shall no flesh be justified in His sight. Right. That is, by good works, man cannot be right in the sight of God. Yet he says we are justified freely. Mm -hmm. That is, it's without Christ, it's without good works, it's without anything in which we can do. There is nothing we can do or pray or pay or say or Amen. acquire of ourselves to be justified. In the sight of God, it must be without being ahead of ourselves to be the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Isaiah 55 and we see this taught here, Isaiah 55 and the first two verses. I know we've all heard of this scripture before. It says, 
Ho, everyone that thirsty, verse 1, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy, and eat. Yea, come, buy wine, and milk without price, or without money, and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Amen. Oh, he tells us here that to come freely to buy this this wine, this milk, this we're told to take of this water and drink freely. So we have nothing which we can purchase anything from God, yet He freely gives it to us. Now, really, nothing is 100% without cost. Even the gift of God is because of the suffering and death of Christ. Amen. Yet we don't have to do anything to earn it or to attain it. In fact, we have nothing that we can do. We have nothing. Amen. We have no money to buy. We have no works whereby to earn it. But as he says here, just come and buy without money, without price. In verse 2, he says, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which satisfieth not? This is exactly what man tries to do in and of himself, isn't it? Amen. He spends his money, he works and works and works. Yet it's all of not spiritually. You know, some men, they buy up this world's goods and work themselves to death to have more and more. Yet you know, spiritually it will do them no good. Right. Other men, they, you know, like I said, they give their money to the quote church in hopes that it's going to buy them eternal life. Others, they work and work that they might earn salvation and get it. That will never satisfy the soul. Only that which comes from God can truly satisfy the need which man has. Amen. We turn over to Acts for a moment, Acts chapter 8, and we'll see an example of one who tried to purchase the gift of God. Right. Acts chapter 8, verse number 18. Here it's Simon and Peter, not not Simon Peter talking to himself, but one man named Simon talking to Peter. And verse 18, we'll pick up here after Simon and Saul was going on. It says, And Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Mm -hmm. That's an natural inclination of man, isn't it? Then, well, here I've got money, I can buy it. That's especially the American way. Right. If we work it up, we can buy anything we want to. It doesn't work that way in God's economy. Amen. Verse 19, he says, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. See, that man just wants notoriety, doesn't he? he doesn't, right. He wasn't worried about the actual gift of the Holy Ghost. He just wanted to have the power to give it. Verse 20, he says, Peter answers him and says, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast or thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this of this thy wickedness, and pray God, perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Amen. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Mm -hmm. See, Peter called him for what he really was. He didn't say, well, put that money away. It's not a big deal. No. He said, my money perish with thee. He said, thou neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right inside of God. If any, any man thinks he can earn salvation or become justified inside of God or be righteous before God in any other way besides Christ, and his heart is not right before God. Amen. Man has all these different systems and teachings and ways of theology that teach that you have to do this or do that or join this church or be baptized or give this amount of money or after your loved ones are passed away, you can 
give so much to the Catholic Church and they'll pray in the Mount of Purgatory. Right. All these foolishness, but yet, really what it comes down to is you must be right before God. There you go. And the only way to be right before God is through the person of Christ. Let's go back to our text here. <clears throat> and he adds on to being justified freely, he says, by his grace. This, this is the means by which we receive this free justification and serve God's unmerited and undeserved favor. Amen. And not only did we not earn it, we didn't deserve it either. Not only did we not deserve it, we were undeserving. We were really the exact opposite of deserving. Right. We deserved to die in our sins. We deserved to receive everlasting punishment from the presence of God. We certainly did not deserve salvation or any good from the hand of God. Yet by His grace, He says, we are freely justified. Mm -hmm. Really, it can't be by any other means, but by His grace can. That's it. You know, any system or denomination that teaches that you must do something or you must do anything at all to earn or keep your salvation or to have a right standing before God or anything like that. They're not of God. They're not of the Bible. Amen. Really, it must be all of grace from beginning to end. So I know there's some that teach, or they say that salvation is by grace, and then they say, well, you've got to hold out faithful or you're not saved. Mm -hmm. I do believe God's people are going to serve Him, but our salvation is not contingent upon if we are faithful. Amen. And then, you know, there's plenty of others that teach you got to do this or do that. Yet that's not a grace. If it's a works, it's no more a grace. And if it's a grace, it's no more works. Paul will say later in Romans. Mm -hmm. It can't be both. It has to be one or the other. That's it. We can't mix works and grace and say that that's the way of God. The scriptures over and over again told us it's by His grace and His grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I think we all know that. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and by yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works, lest a new man should boast. And we say all that, we, I'll add the note that doesn't excuse our lack of works, because it's of grace. But being of His grace means our salvation, the earning of it, or the getting of it, to the keeping of it is not by anything that we do. Right. He says it's by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the means by which we are justified, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, this redemption means that he purchased us. Amen. We were captive, we were slaves to sin, and yet Christ paid the ransom to buy us back. He paid the ransom that would free us from sin. Turn over to John chapter 8 with a few different passages. John chapter 8 and verse number 34 to 36. <coughs> and after Christ said he would, the truth would make them free, they said, well, we've never been in bondage. And that's, they also didn't know in their own history because the children of Abraham have been in bondage several times. Amen. But we all are in bondage to sin. As he says in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that servant is not sometimes like we think of it. It means a slave. One who's in bondage to it. We were the slave of sin by nature. Mm -hmm. But notice verse, we'll read verse 35 and 36. He says, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. And the son therefore shall make you free, he shall be free indeed. Mm -hmm. See, Christ is the only one who can make us free from sin. Mm -hmm. Sin has always been the problem, all the way back to the fall in the garden. Sin has been the problem all throughout history and is still the problem today that must be addressed. Remember when the angel came to Mary and said, 
And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right. Sin is the problem that Christ came to fix, if you will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we were to serve no sin, and yet Christ purchased us, he redeemed us from the curse of sin, from the penalty of sin. We can go over to Matthew chapter 20, and we see that was one of the main purposes which, for which Christ came was to, to redeem us. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28. After explaining the position of minister and servants, and he says in verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. See, Christ didn't come in all his glory to be served and to be just sit on his throne like an earthly king would do and have these people come to him. He will be that in that position one day. Be mad. When he came, he didn't come to be ministered unto. He says to minister. And that was the last part of that verse, and to give his life a ransom for many. There you go. In redeeming us, he paid the ransom for our souls. Mm -hmm. We were sold under sin. Paul says in Romans seven, we were just like the slaves of old times. We were. The property of sin, mm -hmm. and yet Christ paid price to purchase us, which is really a, an humbling thought because we didn't have anything good to offer him. You had. If you were to purchase a slave in the slave days, you wanted one that could work for you, could do what you needed it to do. Hey, we didn't have anything whereby we could offer Christ. You bad. And yet He redeemed us anyway. We didn't have the means by which we could serve him and glorify him. We were completely tainted by sin, and yet he still purchased us to pay our ransom anyway. That is a love beyond carnal understanding. Amen. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. We'll try to draw this to a close. Colossians chapter 1, verse number. 12 through 14. Here, Paul is telling us that we ought to thank God for what he has done for us. He begins in verse 12 and says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, Amen. in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And it's in the Son, it is, it is in Christ, that we have redemption through his blood, and he says, even the forgiveness of sins. And it's only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have redemption. It's only through his shed blood that we can be forgiven. Right. When he redeemed us, he not only freed us from sin, he freed us from the guilt that which we have. That's part of our justification. He made us innocent in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. When we were fully sinful, fully guilty of sin in the sight of God without excuse, yet Christ redeeming us, he brought forgiveness of sins, that we might be innocent and just and right in the sight of God. Amen. And as it says there, and as it said back in our text, that it's, this is, redemption is in Christ Jesus. It only comes through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pope can't offer it. Amen. Brother Larry can't offer it. Amen. Any other man of God or so-called man of God cannot offer it. But only through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even the church itself can Amen. offer redemption. We can only point you to the one that can redeem you. Don't, don't fall into the lies that you can do this and do that to be justified. Don't look to yourself to be a good enough person to be 
right before God. And our justification must come from Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Now, I understand that as we walk in this life, we can do things which are right and which are wrong. And that will affect our, our testimony, and that will affect when we stand before God and give an account for this life. But ultimately, if we're right inside of God or not, it will come down as if we've been born again, if we've been saved by His grace. Amen. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ or whether you're trusting in anything else. So Christ has free justification through his shed blood, and yet man wants to come up with all these other ways that he thinks are better. Amen. Well, as a saved person, I can't think of any other way that's better than the free pardon of sin to the person of Christ. Amen. And it's not like those pardons that we were talking about on Wednesday that you were purchased. No, Christ gives free justification. God gives his gift freely to us. It's unto all and upon all that believe. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the only, if you want to do something, that's the only thing I can tell you to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Even faith comes as a, a gift of God, really, if we want to get down to it. Lord willing, next week we'll pick up in verse 25 and see how Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And then he talks mostly about faith versus works in the rest of the chapter. Mm -hmm. But it always must be a faith and not a works. It always must be to the person of Christ and not be ourselves or any other entity. We are redeemed through Christ or we're not redeemed at all. Amen. Amen.